as a starting point for the interview, I looked at your Wikipedia entry, which is always a dodgy way to start your research, but it's probably where most people start. And um, before we talk about Doc 2, just to talk about your love of film, because you were into film from a very young age. And if Wikipedia is correct, you were the youngest student ever accepted to the London Film School or up until that point, is that right? Yes, that's right, Ian, and, uh, and hello, good to see you. Um, it's, it was, I was 18 when I enrolled at the London Film School uh, back in the late 1980s. And uh, I know it's hard to believe I'm that old, I've got ring lights. So it was normally a post-grad course. So people had to be in their sort of mid to late 20s or had film industry experience or a bit of both. So there was me just 18, joining the London Film School after my A-levels, as it was. And because I'd made some Super 8 films and I was BBC Young Filmmaker of the Year in 1985 um, with a Super 8 camera my parents bought me, they decided to, to uh, take a punt on me and allow me to, to enrol in the school. And gosh, it was tough. It was the Marines of film schools. And at the time, there was only two in the country, that one and the National Film and Television School in Beaconsfield. And I applied to both. I got an offer at both, which was um, looking back, I was kind of like, wow. And I, I plumped for the London Film School because it was um, I'm a Londoner and it was near home for me. But um, I kind of never looked back since. I, I left when I was um, 20 and I thought I was really old at 20. And I started working professionally as a director and, and sort of continued uh, onwards. So um, obviously this is a dot two focused interview, but we have to mention Ray Harryhausen because I, I think there's a big overlap. A lot of dot two fans are, are, are Ray Harryhausen fans as well. So um, the Ray and Diana Harryhausen Foundation, um, of which you are an integral part, um, how did you get involved and how big a part of your life is it? Well, um, probably the best way to show you, I can show you actually, there, there's a picture of me looking how I did when I was 18, quite pale, um, always wearing black. I, I look as if I was auditioning for Depeche Mode. Um, I'd, made a, <laughs> I'd made a documentary about Ray Harryhausen when I was at film school. So yeah. it was a 16 millimeter documentary for 15 minutes and you could do any subject. And I knew that uh, Ray Harryhausen lived in London and I opened up the telephone directory and he was the only R Harryhausen listed. So you did what you did back in those days. You asked your parents first, can you use the phone? They would always say ring after six o'clock when it was cheaper, which I did. And to my surprise, um, Ray Harryhausen himself answered the phone. And this rather booming um, West Coast American voice answered, hello. And I said, oh, is that Ray Harryhausen? Yeah, yeah, that's correct. And so I started to pitch to him. Could I make a documentary? He didn't need to do that. The film students, no real traditional documentary experience. He invited me to his house. That's where we filmed this. The Kraken from Clash of the Titans was filmed upstairs in his study where he kept most of the creatures. Um, so that was in my first year at the film school on my third term, so at the end of year one for me. And I didn't quite realise what I was picking up at the school at the time. It was a fabulous school, the London Film School. If you can ever enrol there and be part of that, do. Um, I started to get my producer credentials because... I've produced all my own programs and, and that's kind of key because if you're in control of your content and your assets and so on, it, it's a key part of things, but you can control who's involved. So I rang up uh, London management who represented Tom Baker and said, oh, um, hello, John Walsh from the London Film School here. Sure. And I said, will uh, Tom Baker do a free voiceover for a documentary on Ray Harryhausen? And they were like, you know, obviously Tom Baker... <clears throat> the fourth doctor gets terrific money for voiceovers and for, for all the work he's involved in. And this would have been the late 80s, so he would have left Doctor Who well behind by then. And it, the, the hook was he won the role of the Doctor after playing Prince Kura in 1973's The Golden Voyage of Sinbad. And Barry Letts, of course, you know the story well, Ian, um, yeah. saw um, that in a cinema. He was looking to cast someone. They'd spoken to well-known names. And they'd spoken to lots of different people at the time including Bernard Cribbins, I found out recently. Um, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and, and of course, you know, Tom got the role and television history was made and, and, and everything else. So Tom Baker was very generous in giving his time to me, a film student. He provided the voiceover for this documentary. It's recently been scanned in 4K and it's part of the Harryhausen archive. And if you, if you Google online, Ray Harryhausen movement into life, you can see a little HD clip there 
and Tom Baker's booming voice. And of course, I wrote the script on a typewriter. And I remember thinking, this isn't any good for Tom Baker to read. And of course, the minute he read it, it was like, oh, it's like he poured audio gold over yeah. the entire script. His professional start was as Willis O'Brien's assistant. But even up to his last film, he has constantly developed his own techniques. Well, model animation is basically the same principle as the animated cartoon, only instead of using flat drawings, you have a model such as this. In each frame of film, you have to change the position of the model. You have to move it very slightly. You have to move the eyes, the nose, the mouth, the arms, uh, many different parts of the body. really got me started in film and TV. I stayed in touch with Ray Harryhausen over the years. He used to show the film at conventions and, and talks. And in recent times, I recorded commentaries for all of his films because unbelievably, Ian, he only recorded commentaries like one or two of his films. Okay. For none of the Sinbads, he didn't do it for Clash. So in his house with a full documentary crew and a digital sound recordist I work with, we recorded. Um, commentaries and we had different people come in and sit in with us John Landis the film director who's a great fan of Ray's fellow American of course always visited Ray when he came to London with his um, Oscar winning wife Deborah Landis the costume designer Colin Arthur special effects man and uh, Caroline Monroe they all kind of stayed friends with Ray so we recorded all these commentaries Ray asked me to become a trustee of his foundation along with daughter Vanessa and um, it was an interesting pick because I hadn't worked on any of Ray's films, but it turns out he saw some of me in him because what people don't know about Ray Harryhausen was, yes, he was an absolute genius at what we see here behind, but he wasn't just a filmmaker. He was also a film producer. And when people think of Hollywood film producers, they might be thinking of Otto Preminger, who's a director, but you normally think of someone who's quite angry, running around and, you know, chewing on a cigar. But Ray and Charles Schneer, who was his film producing partner made these films together so he was always fascinated by the commissioning process for television how things would work so when I had shows on tv or if I was nominated for a BAFTA or other awards you could send out what are called transmission cards which are basically postcards with a little shot of your program on it and the details of when it's on tv I'd always make sure he's on those lists he'd always keep in touch Ray had retired in 1981 unintentionally uh -huh and uh, made his last film Clash of the Titans. It wasn't his intention, but I go through all that in the book, Harry House and the Lost Movies. Um, I became a trustee and I've been with daughter Vanessa Harry House and looking after and advising on the collection, the film restorations, the unmade projects, speaking to interested parties about um, new films, remakes, etc. We have one member of staff, Connor Heaney, who's our collections manager, and he looks after the physical day-to-day -day running of the archive. So between the three of us and sort of our legal reps, we um, we do what the Walt Disney Company does, but with fewer staff. And we are the largest animation archive outside of the Walt Disney Company. So had I not met Ray Harryhausen all those years ago when I was 18 and opened up the telephone directory, I wouldn't have written this book. I wouldn't have written um, the books that followed. Um, so directly after this, it was... Uh, Flash Gordon, the official story of the film. And then that followed um, this one, Escape from New York. And then we come to this one, which is Doctor Who and the Daleks. Now, since Doctor Who and the Daleks, this sounds like terrible boasting, but an American would say, go for it, John. Um, I finished another book, Conan the Barbarian, the official story of the film. And I'm currently working on book number six. So... I've been sort of frantically busy in lockdown when everyone else was catching up with all the box sets of the wonderful TV <laughs> shows like Stranger Things and Umbrella Academy. I've only just watched episode one of Umbrella Academy today. Um, so I'm, um, I'm very grateful. I'm very grateful to have become this accidental author in, uh, in lockdown. Well, I still haven't watched episode one of Umbrella Academy. I, I don't have your excuse, so maybe I should dash off after this and watch it. So we could do two hours on Ray Harryhausen, um, but uh, that's another podcast entirely. So we'll, we'll move onwards to Dot 2. So um, 
Before we talk about the films, John, were you a fan of, or are you a fan of the TV show? Yes, I mean, I'm a massive fan of, of Doctor Who. Um, when um, my mum and dad used to get the radio and TV times as separate um, magazines from the news agents, my brother would get, like the Beano, I would get Doctor Who Weekly. And you can always spot a fan because if they've still got their original collections of Doctor Who Weekly and then monthly and then the magazine and so on, it's, it's, it's the only magazine I would retain. I have some early Empire magazines, but for Doctor Who, I would never bring it to school. Um, I couldn't get plastic sleeves for them. If I had at the time, I would have asked for them. Um, so, yes, a, a proper fan going back all the years reading everything about it, buying the enormously wonderful, beautiful uh, Blu-ray box sets, pouring over every feature, whether it's archive or new features. So I'm uh, in a way, if I was the commissioner for this book, I'd say, don't get John Walsh. He's, he's too involved in Doctor Who. You need someone who's maybe um, uh, interested in film and British cinema, but could do a book and maybe uh, not be bedazzled by speaking to the cast and crew. And to some extent, that's true. But I like to think that we, we have given an honest and true approach to it. But I am a massive fan of both films. Um, and I know that's not um, necessarily um, because it falls outside of the Doctor Who canon. Less so these, these days. I think people are more accepting of it. Um, but it was nice to kind of get into the nuts and bolts of the politics of it. And it's the first time anyone's had access to everything Studio Canal gave me access to their entire deep archive, the paperwork, the completion guarantee people. So, you know, for people like us, and a lot of the pictures you'll recognise, but they're in blisteringly good quality. But there are some in there that I've never seen before. So I'm thinking, oh, if I haven't seen them before, I'm hoping others haven't as well. So uh, here's fingers crossed. So without asking you to give away any of the exclusives, because that wouldn't be fair, um, you say you found new photographs, John. Did you find new documentation and things that threw a new light on the films that perhaps we didn't know about before? Yes, I think so. I mean, um, be between what I know about booking sound stages and booking crew and so on, I was able to ascertain through interviews with, um, with cast and crew and with Anthony Way, who helped me a lot, you will have seen Anthony speaking at BFI events and others. Um, I was able to speak to him about um, the, the delivery of rushes or dailies, as the Americans call them, what was going on there. Lower budget films don't always have rushes screenings every day. And I know when I've in the past shot on film, you can't afford to have a screening room and see rushes every day. That's just a reality. Um, he was able to give me some background on that. We did get to the bottom of how they managed to get Shepperton Stage H which many people think is a sound stage. And to be fair, they advertised it back in the day as a sound stage. It isn't. You can record sound in there, but you know, we're recording sound in here and this is a better environment within which to do it. You know, I'm isolating the sound on my microphone here. I have a professional Radio 4 style microphone, um, better than they could have done in stage H because it was basically like a big MFI, a galvanized space. It had a lighting grid at the top, but it wasn't a true sound stage. So the film had to be re-looped in most parts. But the film had such a tiny budget to be able to afford stage H was because they filmed it in the winter when no one else wanted it or could go in there. And today it would be a health and safety risk because it was way, way too cold. And even if you wear a coat, it's, it's not the same. You know, when you've been out in the winter, wearing a big coat you kind of stay warm to some extent but the cold air you breathe in and put through you and the actors in the film had in some cases quite quite skimpy outfits um it, it wasn't easy and so it was great to kind of drill into some of that and and i always thought if i ever got the chance these are the questions i'd, I'd ask whether it was on flash gordon or escape from york when you get hold of the director you want to know if you had more money than Star Wars on Flash Gordon, why weren't you flying the spaceships using motion control? And you had the people who flew Superman. So why did the Hawkmen not fly as balletically as, as Chris Reeves did um, two or three years previously? So I had those questions, Ian, sort of in my head from years of, of, of reading about Doctor Who and wondering why the film was treated so badly and why Peter Cushing decided to take that performance. And then in the sequel, what really happened? Was he unwell? Was he not? Was there a row with Milton Sabotsky? What about the third film? And there's been all this talk recently about it. So um, 
it's great to be able to find out all of that. Great to be able to get new pictures, ones I haven't seen before. But, but here's the rubby, and this is the difficulty. Do you put pictures in that haven't been seen before that are not that great? Or do you put in the best quality pictures you can, which have been widely seen before? And, you know, you think about magazines that we all love to read. They will obviously choose editorially the best shots. And you don't want like a, you wouldn't have a wedding shot with someone with one eye closed. And you wouldn't want to see necessarily a shot of Peter Cushing accidentally winking in front of or blinking in front of a Dalek. But it's tempting, isn't it? You want to you want to pop it in. Um, so I was quite a geek head. I was able to go through it with the publisher and say, oh, no, we've we've got lots of those. And I think people have seen that picture quite a lot. But I would literally get chills when I saw something. Some of the fans who helped me um, with pictures gave me pictures which they said, oh, this hasn't been published before. And when I clicked and opened it, I could literally get goosebumps. And um, some pictures I was sent, I, I couldn't sit down for like half an hour because I was all kind of agitated. You know, if you won big on the lottery or something, you'd imagine how you wouldn't sleep that night. I started to get sort of ants in the pants with some of the pictures and the artwork that I was being sent. Um, and then I was going back to Titan saying, can I have a bigger book? Um, they're like, no, don't keep asking that. I, I ask it on every book. Can I have more pages, please? I could have done two, two books is what I wanted to do. One on the first film, one on the second. Wasn't to be. So when did you actually experience the films themselves? You're obviously a Dot2 fan growing up, um, probably like myself on, on television. Is that when you first saw them? Yes. So for me, it would have been on Saturday morning TV on the BBC, probably around the time of nearly the first screenings the first screenings are in the in the mid uh, or early 1970s on the bbc um but when it was saturday morning kids is when i would have seen it or late morning to be fair it would have been before grandstand wouldn't it on bbc one um so that's when i would have seen it and the films had very low financial value at that point because when you can repeat a feature film before grandstand on a saturday in in that era it means the license for the film um is very very cheap indeed so fast forwarding to this year where they're charging 50 pounds for one of them in, in what looks like a shoebox. Um, you can imagine people back in the 70s thinking, what's crazy? What's going on there in that future world? But for me, it's great to see them restored to that position. You know, there are James Bond films from, the, from that era that haven't had 4K restorations and releases. I'm sure they will. But to think the Doctor got there first um, with both films and they are modestly budgeted films. So that, that's kind of really exciting. And I followed them over the years. So when Channel 4 showed them in almost full widescreen, and then they were released on VHS widescreen, then the DVD, then the Blu-ray, and then the 4K, I was surprised um, because I thought, knowing how expensive 4K remastering can be, sometimes in the millions um, to do these sort of projects. So people online were worried about the cost, and I understand that. But to go back to the original negative, the work that Canal put in, it was it was more expensive to do this than it was to make the original films. So for them, it's a big risk and a big investment. And this book is, is although it's separate from Studio Canal, it's licensed by them. And I have a strong relationship with them. Um, everyone is going out on a limb because you and I have got the films before. It's you and I they're selling it to. It's not all the young people on TikTok and Instagram, who, you know, who will, of course, buy it, but we're the key market and we're being asked, buy it again. It's like, well, I've just bought in 2013, uh, the Blu-ray, isn't that good enough? And I have to buy a 4K machine to see the 4K and a 4K telly. And it's like, yeah. So it's, it's a big ask. And the question was whether there'd be a market for the book and the film again. The, the book shot straight to number one and the amount that uh, Titan we're going to print now has been massively increased it keep up with demand, which is fabulous. So all of the other books I've, I've written for Tyson have sold well. And there's a Japanese version of Escape from New York. And there's a second edition version now, Flash Gordon, that's just been uh, announced this week. But this has really rocketed and sold like hotcakes, which is, which is really pleasing. And it's great because there aren't many inside pictures to see yet of the book. So people, I think, are buying it on faith, thinking, oh, if it's like John Walsh's other books... Um, and if it's got some half decent pictures in, then then I'll I'll be in with that. Uh, and buying things in advance of seeing them, that's kind of the modern way. You know, the, the Blu-ray sets, I know we know the series, but if you aren't quick to get them, they sell out. So, so for me, the history of watching Doctor Who has always been 
excitedly seeing it being advanced by the time it was shown on channel four it, it had more status and then the first dvd release that was really quite wonderful in the gatefold sleeve and the dalek mania documentary and they, you could see you know studio canal were really the place to look after these films so i suppose it should come as no surprise that canal did this had they been owned by anyone else if they're owned by a broadcaster an independent broadcaster on channel number three let's call it icv they I, they wouldn't be interested in doing 4k remaster um and icv owned lots of classic cinema so it wouldn't be happening there do you have a favorite of the two films because i like many others i suspect have always probably preferred the second because it's a bit faster paced but seeing them again i've really warmed more to the first one because um that sense of discovery of being on a new planet and the sense of adventure particularly from the doctor and um, and susan so do you have a favorite and have your views changed from seeing them again you know at the cinema and on the new 4k release like yourself i i always prefer the action pack second one and it was seemed more grown up and there's knife fights and you know people are dying properly on screen um but i do agree the, the original one now has that origin story and there is that real sense of atmosphere and mystery so even though 4k shows up as it were the um the stitching in the costumes and you can see the the psych on the back of the uh, stage h much more clearly um it doesn't remove any of the magic for me if if anything it enhances it and and i do like the pacing of the first film um the second one is crazy fast like everyone's been drinking coffee um but it works really well and of remastering the previous films the first film always looked better the second film always looked a poor relative certainly on dvd and on vhs um so i was i was concerned that there wasn't a camera negative for the second film because i always thought it looked like it was either from an inter pause or a dupe neg um, or, or from a series of prints and, and that may well have been the case um, whereas the first one always had a, a sharper cleaner look to it now they, they're, they're balanced but no I agree I think as we get older and we look back at the original and think oh actually you know we we're slowing down and the first film is slower for us so maybe we we found our home in film number one well it's interesting John that you say about how things um as you get older you reinterpret them um i'm thinking about the level of humor in the films um some of the humor i felt was a bit silly when i was younger but now i find it's quite well judged um i mean roy castle for example um some of the comic timing um in the first one you know it, the sitting down on the chocolates etc I, I find his, his sort of sense of comedy is quite on the nose do, do you warm more to the humor of the films now yes i do um i think the humor kind of really works and i think because it's set in its own time so when you look back at old maybe peter sellers films or if you're a tony hancock fan um although hancock hasn't really aged terribly badly at all i think hancock's still quite contemporary um it is of its time and, and i think it kind of really works and you know bernard cribbins in in the second film as well has humorous moments um so i think the humor does work well um and and i think the thing for fans to remember is that there hadn't been a regeneration of a doctor at this point you know peter cushing was playing william hartnell from that television series on bbc one the idea that patrick trousen who's a very different actor much younger and who played the doctor very differently would take over um in 90 at the end of 1966 that wasn't on the cards so you know had Peter Cushing known that he might have thought ah oh, well I can do my own doctor I could be number three or five or six or just another doctor so he was slightly hemmed in by doing a Bill Hartnell but through the lens of Swiss Family Robinson keeping sure that there was no crankiness because it had to play to an American audience and and Milton Sabotsky who was right in his kind of aspirations that it should play well in America um, would have found out that the film's biggest box office success was was in the UK so he didn't really have to worry too much about America but it's because of his ambition and he was American himself the idea of returning home with a great big movie um, was always his dream so I think the choices that were made for comedy for styling the idea of it being Swiss, uh, Swiss Family Robinson is, is a quote directly from interview with uh, Milton Sabotsky I think it was made it very different in tone but the humor works and I think you know we think about the humor we think about the relationships now in in modern Doctor Who um you know that there are lots of echoes not to mention the white TARDIS interior door Stephen Moffat loves that yes 
Um, so yes, let's talk a little about Peter Cushing because he's really a man for all seasons um, and hasn't really gone out of fashion, which is great. You know, some older actors from the old days aren't remembered as well, but a lot of what Peter Cushing did still resonates. Hammer films, Star Wars, obviously. Um, 1984 has been re-released re uh, recently, which was great to see. Um, on top of all that talent, it sounds like he was a perfect gentleman as well. Um, so what is the magic of Peter Cushing and why do we still love him today, do you think? Well, with actors who work a lot, the common factor is that they're good people you can get on with. Anyone who gives trouble, it soon gets round, either through whispers from producer to producer or through insurance company claims because someone's turned up late or they've bawled someone out and so on. So I think Peter Cushing understood early on that uh, to be a jobbing actor and to be um, dependent financially on, on solely acting work, which when we think about other actors from the time might have had to serve at tables or rent rooms out in their house and so on, you know, he was always in demand because he was reliable. You know, he was certainly a very gifted and talented actor. There's no question to take that away from him. And he brought a certain something, but he was a reliable person. He was always there. And on the second film, when he when he fell unwell, there was a big insurance claim. We have details of that in the book. Um, he did everything he could to make sure that he he got the production back, um, more or less back on schedule and, and more or less back on budgets. So all of the reminiscing that so I spoke to everyone who's still alive um, who, for the book, even uh, people like Brian Hens, who was a Dalek operator, an established actor now, but a Dalek operator then, they all remember that he had time for people between takes, that he wasn't really aloof. And I know there's been a recent interview that Anthony Way gave to SFX magazine, which um, suggests that Peter Cushing didn't mix socially with people. Um, you know, when I'm on film shoots, I don't go for, you know, I'm a teetotaler, so I don't tend to go off drinking. People don't drink at lunchtime now, that, that's very much frowned upon. But afterwards, if there's a big social scene of people going out, it's not always a great idea to do that. And Peter didn't do that. Um, but lots of actors don't do that. But during the day, would have tea on sets. The tea and biscuit trolley would come around at around four o'clock, very nice. I couldn't get details on what the cakes were. I wanted to know were they like a, a, a vanilla slice and because it's that kind of detail helps build the picture because only on an English film set would you get basically Greg's on a trolley with a cup of tea. Um, but he didn't kind of scurry away into a dressing room as, as people often did on some films. And you can understand that, particularly with stage H being so cold. So um, I think keeping good relations with his key players, Roberta Tovey, who played granddaughter Susan, that was essential because there was a real connection in performance there. Uh, Roberta's written the foreword for the book and uh, she is a great champion of the film and has been interviewed over the years. And we spoke to everyone else, you know, uh, Jill Curzon and, and Jenny Linden and so on, and Bernard Cribbins. Um, they, they all shared that view that, that uh, he was a real gentleman. And, you know, he, he continued with Milton Sabotsky because he'd done, um, um, uh, was it a Train of Terror um, with him just before? I haven't got the book in front of me now. You think I'd know that. Um, and he was part of... Um, those amicus films that were Doug McClure films or at the Earth's core with Caroline Monroe. And he kind of reprised his Doctor Who role there as well. If you look at that performance, that's quite Doctor Who-ish. It's a few years later and he's aged a little bit there as well. But I always thought that, that as being the third, as it were, unofficial Doctor Who movie. We talk about that in the book. That Those films are now also owned by Studio Canal who've looked after them really well. But I think, you know, he really holds that film together and I think over the years, he's come in for, for um, a lot of criticism from people who've compared him with doctors who've come in later years and wondered why he didn't do his own doctor. And I can understand that, why people would think that. But I'm, I'm hoping that one of the uh, rights, um, one of the wrongs we can put right with the book is, is, is to explain that. And uh, we had special permission from the BBC to include lovely shots of William Hartnell as, as the first doctor on the same pages with, um, with Peter Cushing. And for people like us, we're like, ooh, whereas anyone else will think, hang on, you've managed to get someone from an old TV series and an old film on the same page together. I don't, I don't get it. Whereas there's, there's always been a, um, a, a, I won't say a chasm, but there's always been a distance between the people who own the film 
and what goes on with the BBC. So, so to get those people to, to kind of meet, I'm not saying I should get the Nobel Peace Prize, but I mean, it, it serves something, maybe a sash. What do you think, Ian? Yeah, well, the Nobel Film Prize, if such a thing exists. I'll take um, it. <laughs> so um, you mentioned some of the other cast members there, John. Um, how do you feel that the, um, the female roles come across in the sort of cold light of... Um, 2022 because I must admit re-watching them I thought that um, Susan in particular is a very strong um, younger female character um, so what, what, what's your view on that and, and uh, Barbara and Louise as well? Well a lot of these films now we look back and then we have notices on the front saying that the, there's a cultural difference between when the films were shot and now and that you know there might be a discrepancy in what we think are appropriate role models and so on um, and, and views. Um, I think that's on these two films as well. And I was surprised to see that because I didn't think there was anything there that, that we need to raise an eyebrow in particular. I thought Susan's performance was particularly strong, uh, Roberta's performance of Susan. And she's given so much to do, um, way more than she should have done, by the way, because the stunts in the second film, they didn't have, um, they had a stuntman taking Andrew Keir's place as he drives through um, Smashed Up London, which was the uh, backstage um, lot at Shepson Studios, crashing through the Daleks. A stuntman was driving for him, but she was sat there with no seatbelt on because they didn't have a small stunt person to play Susan. So it's kind of like, that's just crazy. That would not happen now. Um, so I think the production leaned on her kind of extensively, and I'd like her to have had even more to do in the second film. I think the difficulty was it was quite a violent film and they had a series of parallel narratives um but everyone was paired off so you had um, bernard cribbins and jill curzon paired off there was um the, the doctor piece of cushing was paired off with ray brooks andrew keir and susan paired off the daleks are pairing themselves off um so it gave you lots of parallel narratives but perhaps perhaps it gave short shrift to some of the characters including the doctor but that was partly because Peter cushing was unwell and did have to leave the production for a certain amount of time and it was quite a large insurance claim we go into that in the book um Roberta was unsure and over the years had thought that wasn't true because he was around um so she wasn't necessarily I mean she was wrong but she she wasn't necessarily misremembering it because her scenes were often with Andrew Keir and were in the um on the way to Watford and on the way to Bedfordshire um so and there are, there are some shots of Peter in the film that are a stand-in around the saucer set. So when he runs off into the distance with, um, with Ray Brooks, that's, uh, that's someone standing in for Peter in his costume. So I, I think they, they come out of it really well. And we think about Doctor Who today, and we think about the stronger presence that female characters have. And, I, and I'm talking about the Russell T Davis plus years. Um, you know, we look at the films and we see that you know, Jenny Linden and Jill Curzon had really strong roles and had lots to say. And in fact, I said this to, to, to um, Jill Curzon, her outfit looked like she was Doctor Who. She could quite easily have been a, a Time Lord herself with that outfit. Very Sherlock Holmesy. If she had been a, another Time Lord, you would have thought, yep, that looks right. So I think, you know, it, it was an accidental nod to what was coming in the future. So I think, you know, the, the female roles for that time and for that film were, um, were, were as rounded as the male roles were. So I think that's, that's something to be, um, to be pleased about because had the film had significant problems in that area, then re-releasing it on this scale with this expense might have been uh, problematic. So have you actually had chance to sit in a cinema, um, a public screening with other members of the public when, when the films were re-released the other week? Did you, did you go out and watch them? Um, I, I saw them um, privately at Studio Canal, so I got to see them uh, back earlier in the year before, uh, before the public, which was, which was wonderful because part of my research for the book. And uh, so, but it is great sitting with an audience. I haven't done that yet, but I'm planning to do that. So they are still on release at the time that we're speaking here. So um, it's, it's wonderful. Did you have a good time with an audience? Well, um, I went to um, a screening at a um, Everyman Cinema. Other cinema chains are available. Um, and it wasn't terribly well attended. There was about half a dozen of us, but um, it was interesting that some of the younger people there 
uh, I'd say in the 20s, really seemed to um, enjoy it. And um, I heard one younger person comment afterwards um, that was um, awesome and hilarious, which I thought was quite a good one line review of the films, i.e. spectacular and fun. Um, so, um, you know, I think modern audiences will hopefully get something out of it. You know, they look great and they are fun. They're, they're not dull, are they? They're, um, they? They zip along at a fair old pace. Yeah, I mean, if you would compare them to Terry Nation's two serials yeah. at the time, I mean, obviously it's, it's an unfair comparison in one way, but um, the sharpness of image that we'll never be able to do that um, with current technology for the the 16 mil telecordings and even if they found the quad tapes from the from the 60s that 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 simply isn't possible um and, and and younger audiences are used to seeing things in 4k instantly so even factual programs on netflix and prime now stream in 4k um so the idea that something isn't 4k um, and is standard def is 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 really a big disadvantage in the kind of the doctor who universe but i mean the blu-rays are, are starting to address that but um no, it's great that young people can connect with the films. If they couldn't, I don't think the release would have happened because I'm not sure with the total spend down at Canal for, for the book, for the um, 4K release and, and the box set and everything that went with it, I think they really needed to be sure there was an audience there who was also willing to pay for it um, because it, it has to be paid for. I mean, it's, you know, there are standard versions in, in um, Steelbooks. So if you want to, avoid buying all the little booklets and the, the coin and all of that you can so there is an option there as well um i did a couple of unboxing videos on my youtube channel um which if people subscribe to they can um kind of see a bit more about about what's what's happening and they have a chance of winning a signed copy of this as well um i like all that stuff you know i am first in the queue for box sets with extra bits and bobs and I would much prefer obviously deleted scenes and, and outtakes and so on, but they don't exist. You know, when you know how a film negative is cut from a work print on a steam deck bench, then you'll know that anything that doesn't make it into that agreed locked cut um, gets thrown away. I mean, it literally gets put in the bin or is used as junk spacing. So the idea that there are trims out there for Doctor Who and the Daleks, I mean, it's, it's highly unlikely. For Flash Gordon, I found photographs of scenes that hadn't made it to the last um, cut. Even if the film exists, the sound won't, because it's recorded separately on tape. Um, so it's never married to the film until, um, well, really until the dubbing stage, at a very later stage. So what, what we're going to get here is this is it. There, there aren't any outtakes. So you know I'm, I'm pleased that audiences like this and even though the retail market for dvds has shrunk massively you won't see them in supermarkets and you don't rent films from your local news agents anymore these sorts of box sets are actually on the on the rise and i think it's partly thanks to the bbc's wonderful relaunch of the doctor who blu-ray sets because i was kind of anxious when they were coming out because i was thinking god i hope these sell well and i hope the fans will buy them because um i just want this to keep going it's all right for me because I can afford it. And I'm thinking, gosh, you know, I hope people who can't afford it will try and afford it because I want it to keep going. And I was so relieved when it was this enormous success and the first Tom Baker box set just sold out instantly. And it's like, oh, I can breathe now because when they've released more recent series from other doctors, um, you know, Colin Baker, he was a great doctor, great series. Um, I'm not as anxious. And it's great to see that they are received well. And I watched the... Um, sales figures as well as a way of watching all of that online so i, I am a, a bit of a worrier so i do worry for doctor who i don't know why because uh you know i think i think we're all a bit of a worrier aren't we we are but then again we we got through the 90s didn't we so um doctor who in all its forms just seems to keep bouncing back so um yeah um and there's different ways of um, measuring success. I think people are quite harsh on the Jodie Whittaker era, saying it's diving off in popularity. I, I truly don't believe it is. I just think TV audiences are watching in different ways. And, you know, looking at TV viewing figures in the same way isn't really a fair assessment. You have to look at the other ways in which people watch TV now at the moment. Absolutely. And there'll come a time when people look back at Jodie Whisker and think, 
she was wonderful she was marvelous yeah. and you know she is wonderful and marvelous i mean not saying that but you know peter cushing was derided at certain points in in doctor who history and now hopefully not mostly he, he isn't but you know the only other franchise to go through such seismic changes is is james bond and a, a, a bond kind of defines an era so whether you're a roger moore or a connery or a, a pierce brosnan uh, fan it's it's those sorts of things really do define um apologies there my phone was just going off what judas i am it went off with a um star trek ringtone star trek classic series ringtone how um but i i have got a, a tardis backing on it but uh partial judas only apologies there um so no it's it, it's always um it's always pleasing to see the films doing as well as they do and I, and I know that the fans can be quite kind of critical. I know John Nathan Turner had to put up with a lot when he was the producer, but I think fans feel very protective, don't they? You know, of, of Doctor Who and sure. and if if a, if, a, if a creature returns or a monster returns and hasn't been given full justice, and you know, I remember when Destiny of the Daleks, although I haven't got round to watching that box set yet, I have it still sealed in plastic. I'm starting it this week. I remember when that came back and everyone was really kind of pumped to see the Daleks again, and then some of the reviews were a bit sniffy. And I was like, oh, I was anxious for Doctor Who then. And now that's crazy to think of that because that season is just absolute gold. It is, yeah. There's a lot of good stuff um, to enjoy there, especially with a bottle of wine, watching something like City of Death or something like that. But, uh, so just to go back to the book, um, you've, as you said, you've done quite a few um, t uh, sorry, movie related books, Flash Gordon, for example. I'm just interested in the mechanics of write, writing a book about films. Where, where, where do you start off? Um, is it with paperwork? Is it with um, your own feelings about the film? What, what are the mechanics of writing a book about um, a film, a famous film? Well, in the case of these large format coffee table art books, um, I, I come across a problem immediately that other writers perhaps don't. So if this was just a kind of a, a 200 page novel size book and there was a couple of stills in the center, that's fine. These books, because they're coffee table art books, the images are kind of key and you have to be sure that not only have you got enough of them, that there's enough color ones and they're in high enough res if they're black and white and that you have the rights and they're cleared and so on. So luckily with the last few books, they've been... Um, licensed by Studio Canal, who are the rights holder. But even then, you know, there, there haven't been the amount of images that I've wanted to see. If we think about a Star Wars making of book, so the classic Star Wars, A New Hope from 1977, that, that film costs about a, a quarter of what Flash Gordon cost in 1980. And yet there are hardly any behind the scenes stills from the film. Partly because Dino De Laurentiis wasn't keen, he was the producer, wasn't keen on there being lots of kind of shots behind the curtain, as it were, revealing too many of the secrets. And, and also the film was shot very, very quickly. It's part of the reason why they couldn't aff afford the time, but they had the money, ironically. They couldn't do motion control. They had to fly things on wires. Uh, Martin Bauer created a lot of those model sequences and they were fabulous. And, you know, they have their own kind of appeal, but... Um, for me, that was the breakthrough book because the rights were with Studio Canal, but also King Features, um, part of the Hearst Empire, who owned the comic strip, and Universal Pictures in, in Hollywood. And so people had tried to write that book before, and they couldn't get everyone sort of around a table. I did that uh, just before lockdown and, and got everyone to kind of agree it. And I thought, great, now we can do the book. And I got the shock of my life when I found out that the cupboards were bare. There are no decent photographs for Flash Gordon to be found. There's the usual front of house sets and shots of Sam Jones in the vest and the T-shirt and that sort of thing. Where are the spaceships? Where are the shots of the deleted scenes? Where are the, the comparison photos that you'd see in a making of Star Wars book or The Empire Strikes Back or Return of the Jedi? Where are those photos? So I'd set myself this task of, I mean, I'd signed to do the book anyway, so I'd you know, we were delivering 200 page book regardless, but I really wanted to find the pictures that would make you think, oh, not seen that before. So I spent more time sort of Indiana Jonesing the photos and I almost did writing the book and speaking to the cast and crew. And sort of one thing led to another and I got contacts from here and from there and different auction houses helped me and private collectors. So Flash Gordon is really full of the most amazing photography now and the second edition book, which has some late arrivals that I pop back in and 
we reprinted after first one uh, sold out. I took that through to Escape from New York and now on to Doctor Who and the Daleks, but particularly here with Doctor Who and the Daleks, remembering photos I'd seen, obviously in, in Doctor Who magazine, but also Radio Times, and over the years, different publications, being sure that I had the best I could get um, and finding some in colour and finding ones that I hadn't seen before. And I mean, I, I don't claim to be, even though I'm geeking out with the background and the, and the Dalek here, you're probably much more knowledgeable on Doctor Who, Ian, than I am. So I'm kind of hoping that what you see in the book, you'll go, oh, didn't know that, or I haven't seen that before, or you've seen a picture wider because... This is what happened with photos for Doctor Who and the Daleks. And we talk about this in the introduction. And it's something that's, um, it's, it's, it's a, when we think about the BBC throwing out episodes of um, William Hartnell and, and even John Persby and so on, you know, I just watched The Demons there on the weekend and it looks superb, but it didn't need to have all that TLC because actually if they had the original quad tapes, it would look even better. Anywho, everyone knows that story really well. Here on this movie, Milton Sabotsky never kept any of his paperwork for any of his films. So the only stuff that was kept was by film finances, the insurance company, and that's printed paperwork. Okay, so where do we go for photos? Studio Canal had some photos. They're eight by 10 black and white prints. And they were photos that had either been salvaged from newspapers or had been sold back to Canal or they'd been found by collectors because most of the photography that was done for the film was done on color film. It was printed up as black and white eight by tens for newspapers because they prefer that for printing. It made it just easier with a grayscale. Can't really send a color photo to a newspaper. They'll have to make a black and white version of it and it can delay things being printed. You make it easy for them by sending them eight by 10 black and whites because the newspapers in the day in the course were the internet of that era. If you wanted people to know it was in the newspaper. If it wasn't, they didn't know. So all of the colour versions of the photos for Doctor Who and the Daleks were kind of tossed to the wind. And we have some of them in the book here, and we have some restored as well. And so we've done our best to find as many as we can, but that happens on so many films. And it's like, you know, does no one care? And it's true, no one does. You know, I know television companies that have thrown away master tapes because they wanted a larger corner office for an executive. And it's like, wow, so you've eaten into that library space. It's like, yeah, we didn't need all that old stuff. And it's like, how do you know it wasn't Masters? Didn't say on the tin. Ah, so, you know, for people who make their own shows, I don't write Masters on my Masters. I keep them all because I know everything is a Master tape and I keep kind of safety dubs and so on. But I mean, the fact it doesn't have a red sticker on it saying Master and they can, they can easily roll off. It's like, really? And it's like, yeah, and we didn't have a machine to play it on. And then they needed the corner office because he's starting next week. And it's like, wow, you know, so whether it's big companies like Fremantle or Thames TV or others, the flip side of that argument is you can't keep everything for everyone. I mean, do you want the news from 1975 when not much happened perhaps in the middle of the year? And it's kind of like, yeah, I can understand, but for Doctor Who to have kept all of the master tapes, and I'm not talking about the rushes now, I'm talking about just the shows that transmitted on a Saturday night. You could put them all in a 1930s semi and still have space for Sapphire and Steel and Blake Seven. Yeah. And it's like, really? Yep, you could have bought a place up in Middlesbrough or something like that and just put them in there. And yes, it's not temperature controlled, but it would mostly be okay. That's, that's all that needed to be done. But short-term thinking and commissioners who only last a year or two years and so on, they're not bothered about what went in the past. So it's down to people like us, the fans, to kind of keep things alive, keep talking about it. Ray Harryhausen kept so much stuff because he was a child of the Great Depression. He was 13 in 1933 when King Kong came out, and that changed his life forever. But America was in its, its horrible, horrible depression. And so Ray knew the value of clothes and food and paper. I mean, I found sketches in the archive from classic films which were letters that had been sent to him, you know, sort of business letters, where he'd done an elaborate sketch for one of the, the Sinbad films. And it's because he used that paper because the other side was blank. Um, but the upside of that was meant he, he hardly threw anything away. So we have most of the creatures and a lot of the paraphernalia and so on. If only somebody, like if Sidney Newman could have been frozen and if he was interested enough to do it and could have kept everything, I would have 
put him in that house in the north of England with all those tapes and a, and a big taser gun. So make sure no one comes here unless they're giving you new tapes. Um, but it's easy to look back, isn't it? With our eyes now, we can look back and say this is what should have done and what could have been done. But at least Doctor Who is, is fully with us in, in most cases. Yes, it's hard to know how future generations will um, perceive uh, the present day. I mean, I guess now um, a lot of um, internet content is not seen as being of value. Um, you know, websites are updated all the time. Podcasts possibly aren't always kept. So perhaps in the future we will regret that. But it's hard to know, isn't it, what will have value and be of interest in the future. Um, just thinking um, about the 60th anniversary of Dot Two next year, um, I just wondered where you felt the two films fit into um, the sort of ongoing history of Dot Two. One thought that I had was um, watching the films, the sense of family, because you have um, um, Barbara and Susan both being the Doctor's. Um, granddaughters um it's almost foreshadowing russell t davis that sense of family in there so i, I quite like that what, what what do you think the films give us now in the current era how do they fit into that ongoing history of dot two well i think sort of stylistically and certainly from a production design point of view you know the the the, the circle that if you like was started in one direction by television and in the other direction by the movies is now being met because the the production design and the uh, the, the high levels of, of of kind of production value that you get today is very much like the movies. Um, you know, the Jodie Whittaker series more so than any other has looked feature film level. And that's simply because the BBC have put more time and resources behind it, which is fabulous. And certainly in terms of content, that idea of family, as you say, with Russell T Davis and and Rose, how she came back and we met Rose's family and so on. Um, I, I think there's a, a higher kind of concentration on relationships and the companions and their life story and how they're affected. And that didn't really happen much in classic Doctor Who because of serialized television and how things worked. So I think, you know, certainly a, de a design aesthetic and a kind of a narrative aesthetic has, has kind of come full circle, but in different directions. And, you know, for the sixth year, Peter Cushing is meeting now with, with, as it were, the new Doctor who's kicking off. And, you know, it's great that my book's coming out in the heat of the 60th kind of um, racking up. And, and, you know, we'll have a new doctor next year as well, which is very exciting. And uh, yeah, our first black doctor as well, which is, which is very exciting. And, you know, when people look back at Peter Cushing and his performance, the fact that this sells well and the book is selling well is really credit to Milton Sabotsky, his vision for making the film the way he did and, and making two of them. Um, you know, he nearly made the third one, which was going to be based on the chase. It wasn't King Crab. That's not to say, I've spoken to the Sabotskys about this in the book as well. Um, the King Crab story was a later one. The reason King Crab was um, going to be, um, um, I don't want to say bastardised, but it effectively was going to be bastardised from another story, was because it wouldn't involve um, Terry Nation and the Terry Nation people. Because if we had gone with the chase, it would have been Daleks again and the Mechanoids, of course. And I think Milton was keen to avoid extra rights issues and there was no problem with Terry Nation and his people <clears throat> all of that worked out very well but I think he was keen to do something different um, and keen to avoid the rights issues Milton had a bit of a difficult time of it in the 80s and we go into that in the book he, he did make one of my very favorite science fiction tv series which is now available on blu-ray kind of a, a plug there for um, Ray Bradbury's The Martian Chronicles which looks absolutely super Herb on Blu-ray. It's great score from Stanley Meyer and of course standout performance from Rock Hudson. And if if you like your sci-fi a bit more dreamlike, definitely track down the Martian Chronicles. It's on Blu-ray with I think it's Kino Libor, the American label, and it's definitely worth getting because it looks fabulous. And you know Milton was trying to do sci-fi. He was ahead of the game with getting Doctor Who in the cinemas. You know he was the first producer to. Um, optioned the books of a new young writer in the 70s, in the early 70s, who went on to become a great success, Stephen King. So the first person to commission or to option Stephen King. And as a result, he ended up having contractual uh, credits on 
on so many of the films that were made in the 80s by Dino De Laurentiis of all people. So, you know, without people like Norton Sapotsky, this, this really wouldn't have happened. And I think, you know, had he been around today, I would have had so many questions for him. Um, I, I would have just, a bit like Ray Harryhausen, I would have just, just kept talking and talking and talking because th- what would you ask? You know, that question people say, if you had a dinner party guests, who would you have around the table? And for me, Milton Savotsky, because there's lots I found out about him from the book and from his family, but there's so many more questions. And um, yes, there'll always be more questions. So a question for you. Um, let's look into 2023 and beyond. Obviously, this year you've got the book coming out. So um for my Doctor Who or anything, what what's next for, for John? What's what's coming up for you in the future? Um, well, I've just finished um, Conan the Barbarian, the official story of the film, which should have been out this year for the 40th anniversary of um, the Conan film. Um, but it's going to be in August 23. We're doing a special San Diego Comic-Con launch for the book then. And uh, we've got a lot of the original people and players involved with that. And we've got for the first time images from the Oliver Stone version, which have never been seen before, and details of what Stone was going to do Um before John Milius came on board with Dino De Laurentiis again. Yeah, I seem to be following the, the legacy of Dino around quite a lot. Um, so that, that's, that's pretty much finished, just the layouts now to be completed there. And uh, I'm starting on another couple of books, which I'm not allowed to talk about, but um, uh, one involves uh, uh, a film that's having a big um, anniversary next year. And so um, that's very exciting. Oh, and something I forgot to ask, um... Why a book about Doctor Who? You're a filmmaker. Did you did you think about making a film about the films, or did you think um, a book was the right medium for presenting the information that you gathered? But the approach I take with the books is like filmmaking. So you asked me earlier, where do you start with a book? Well, I put together a treatment, and I write something which is quite kind of brutal about what works, what doesn't, over like two or three pages, and that becomes the spine of the book, the various chapter headings. And I set myself sometimes impossible goals to find out what happened at different stages. And so the, for people who've read the books, they feel like it kind of reads like a documentary film. And I've also done vodcast series and there's playlists on my YouTube channel that you can see um, for each book, because there's always more that can be put into a book, whether it's details about the music or the effects or things that were found after the books were published. Although I don't think that's really happened um, any of the cases but um it's just another way of engaging with um, readers so podcast series on my youtube channel where you can find most of my tv shows as well i have a couple of films on prime video monarch about the death of henry the eighth starring some ex-doctor who people tp mckenna of henry the eighth eugene marsh as an amalgamation of his wives and james coombs of course who was in sharda and peter miles who played nida in genesis of the daleks and who also appeared in the Silurians and Invasion of the Dinosaurs. Damn you all! And I made a very controversial, and it's got lots of swearing in it, political documentary movie called Tory Boy the Movie back in 2010, which gets people very animated and excited. So I'm now the candidate for Middlesbrough. Ooh. That's that's on Prime Video as well, so you can kind of track both of those down. There's links, as I say, on my website to find out more. I, I read about that um, uh, film and I'm intrigued about it. And it, 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 I can imagine it might be quite topical at the moment with um, all the uh, political goings on. So I think that will be a good one um, to track down. So, um, yeah, the message, I guess, is let's hope people read and enjoy the book and continue watching the films. And um, it's all good. Long, long live Doctor and the Daleks. <laughs> Absolutely, I couldn't have put it better myself, Ian. And uh, and thanks for having me on. It's been great to see you. And uh, if I do another Doctor Who book, I'd uh, be happy to come back. Oh yeah, we'd we'd love to um, catch up with you again. So um, thank you very much. All the very best. My pleasure. Cheers. <laughs> <laughs>